Welcome back to another session of Lean AppSec. My name is Katie McKean, and I'm a developer advocate here at Endor Labs. And today for this session, I'm really excited. We have a great panel to talk about how to build culture and process around prioritization, application security risks, without pitting engineering and security teams against each other. So today with us, I have Davian, Jivan, and Rachel. And for those of you at home who may not know them yet, can you guys give a little introduction of who you are, what your role is, and where you're located so the folks at home know who you are? Rachel? Sure. I'm Rachel Taylor. I'm the Senior Manager of Information Security Risk and Trust here at Docker. Try saying that three times fast. <laughs> um, I'm located in Tampa, Florida. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Jivan? Uh, I'm James Singh. I run the product security and cloud security teams here at Twilio. I'm a longtime developer that turned the security person about 10, 10 years ago, and I'm based in Vancouver, uh, Canada. Looks yeah. like a beautiful day there. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, if I actually look outside, it's raining a lot. <laughs> well, well, hopefully it's sunny skies today. And Damien. Yeah. I'm Damien. I'm the head of engineering for Endor Labs, and I'm located in Palo Alto, California. Perfect. Well, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to be here. So let's dive in. So first question is, can you describe the workflow of risk alerts? So taking things from open source security risk as an example, right? How does that information about vulnerability flow from security teams to engineering teams? What has been your experience, Rachel and Jivan? Sure. Um, so we know that security tools can create a lot of noise and a lot of what my job and goal is just to reduce that noise. So I'm looking at vulnerabilities as they come in and we're trying to apply automated like policies behind them. So looking at the score, looking, pulling in different information from different databases to see, is there a fix available? Um, is the open, like for example, open source is a good one. Debian is one. Sometimes a CBSS score may come in, it's 9.8, but Debian says that's actually low risk. It's not really exploitable for us. We're not gonna fix it. So we're just trying to make sure that we're looking at the actual risk to our environment, tailing it to our environment, and only pushing um, vulnerabilities to engineers that have a fix available. So reducing the noise and making sure that we're staying streamlined with those engineering teams. Yeah, I, I love that answer, Rachel. Like, uh, We ultimately want to make sure that engineers are doing actual security work and not busy work. It's the worst when you give them a ticket and there's no fix available um, so that you lose that trust between uh, engineering and security. And uh, I just sort of want to echo those sentiments uh, just in general, like you really want to partner with engineering and make sure that you are a good partner and you listen to one another. And I I love going through what I um, call a crawl, walk, run, and potentially sprint a cycle in itself, because you want to make sure that you are working closely with them uh, and that the risk does actually get to them. So. I've been at companies where uh, folks thought it was a good idea to um, hand in had the ticket all of the tickets over to engineering. So, and if you have SCA at an enterprise, Docker is big, Twilio is big. That could literally be millions of tickets sent over to them, which uh, doesn't do anyone uh, any good service. So, um, what I love usually to start off with is crawl and just create dashboards of the vulnerabilities, break it down by the teams that we use, allow engineers across the org and. Um, and a lot of them will actually preemptively fix these. Um, walk is where you actually create, create tickets for them and only for the worst, the most severe issues uh, in general. Uh, you want, want to make sure those get fixed and then you slowly start lowering the bar afterwards. Uh, run to sort of create the gates so that you're at, not adding more major vulnerabilities in the ecosystem and sprint auto patch wherever possible. So that slow flow of fix goes in there and then you're also eventually becoming proactive and not letting things come in so you don't generate more alerts in itself. So uh, definitely want to partner with engineering to do that. So I heard both Rachel and Jivan both mention alert madness, chaos. Damien, your experience is running engineering teams. You know, Would you say that's very true? And how does your team kind of view what the vulnerability you know, flow of information looks like from your end? It is true. The thing is like from our end, it's another work stream. I have to balance at least three work stream. What I need to do, take that scalability, like all the topic related to engineering, what product needs me to do, and then the product, new feature, etc., and what my peers need me to do. So like security is one of the other work streams. So I have to compete all of these priorities. 
usually what come from security, it's a lot of like unplanned work. It destroys my velocity. It destroys my capability of like shipping fast. So it become a tax for us. So usually it's not an immediate happy reaction. That's why it's very important to have a very strong partnership with the security team. With a, we'll go beyond that. We'll do the primary work to investigate the issue and only trigger me if I actually have something to do and I'm not going to waste my time. It's all about not being a tax. And it's very important because if I spend my time fixing stuff that don't need to be fixed, obviously the relationship will be damaged, but also that time I could be spending uh, developing new features, improving my my uh, software architecture. Um, that's not going to be positive. So we need to spend time on reducing these tax because all of this is very expensive. Like there is no quick fix. I have to test, like if it goes through an upgrade, I have to test maybe like breaking change, this new library may pull a new library, et cetera, et cetera. You end up in a dependency hell and yeah, it can cost a lot of time. So doing all of this work of qualification is extremely important. To have a strong partnership is very important too. Now you all alluded to qualification. Are there cer certain things that you're looking for in regards to what qualifies as a vulnerability to pass on to engineering? to make it, you know, to Damien's point, worth their time to look at since he is kind of load balancing all these different work streams. Yeah, I can start with this one. Yeah, like um, we, we definitely want to reduce on the false positives. So there are, and I know that we're talking about open source uh, vulnerabilities. Um, there are a lot of tools that provide reachability and provide it quite well. So um, you may, like we talked about having a million vulnerabilities in your ecosystem, if only 1% or 10% actually apply, that greatly reduces the amount of work that engineering has to do in order to remediate uh, issues uh, in general. So imagine if you had a critical vulnerability with a mature exploit from a generic tool, um, and you you don't want to go through them individually to determine if, if this will actually impact your business. But if the tool provided reachability and you know that it actually uh, has impact, you probably want to move really quickly and get that patched up. So uh, it's really important to actually provide the true positives and send them over to engineering. And then they know that we're fighting for them and we're not giving them busy work as well. Okay, that's one of the reasons I joined Endor Lab because of the reachability, because yeah, from an engineering standpoint, you are going the extra mile to make my life easier and only trigger me for real stuff and not all the noise that... Um, can have a big impact, um, not only in velocity, but also on the production. Yeah, I agree. I mean, really looking at what's the risk, right? So, which is the topic of today, but, you know, is this exploitable? Is it exploitable in your environment, right? Like you know, Docker has both desktop and web apps. If it's only exploitable in the web, then it doesn't impact Docker desktop, right? So you have to look at each in individual product, tool, API like differently, right? And then also looking at, has it been exploited in the wild? Is, is it really exploitable? Are we seeing anything yet? Um, you know, and, and as I mentioned before, like is whoever produces that open source, are they going to do a fix? Is it something we can fix ourselves or do we have to rely on a third party? You've got to look at all of that. And that really determines the risk rating you apply. Um, you know, too, too often we're relying on the risk rating that's given to us by a third party penetration test or an external body. And it's not customized. Like no two environments are the same. Why are we treating all vulnerabilities? Like it's the same across every organization. Well said. I, I don't think I could have said that any better myself, Rachel. So let's get into to the tactical, right? So what practical steps have you taken to kind of make this process more efficient? And I know that's kind of opening Pandora's box, but what are some things that all of you have done to make this process more efficient and really strengthening that partnership between security and engineering throughout this process? I can go first. So I want to, like, as uh, Richard was saying, a very strong partnership between engineering and security. Um, I usually have like a weekly one-on-one -on -one, uh, with my SecOps peer, so I can uh, be aware of like what's top of mind for this person and what's top on mind. I can reshare and balance priorities. Um, give a seat to security to like all the roadmap planning session we have. So make sure we have capacity to address all of the issues. And basically, we don't have to chase capacity afterward. Um, what I've done also in the past is like I send some of my developers to like a security bootcamp with a SecOps team. So they train them, they are champions. They maybe get more access than a normal developer, but at least SecOps as a way to prioritize their issues and they are not blocked by us. 
and vice versa, set up, send people to my team. And um, I train them, give them more permission and have this embedded model works very well. So we have someone dedicated to treat this issue, spend this um, time to investigate, resolve and partner and communicate more and a very smooth and, and very effective partnership. Yeah, the partnership between security and engineering is so important. If you don't get that right and you know you don't have a good working relationship, it's going to make kind of all of the downstream dependencies so much more difficult. Um, Honestly, one of the first steps I do is, you know, owning InfoSec and compliance is documenting a process and make sure I have stake all the different stakeholders at the table. So that means all the different stakeholders across all the different engineering teams, you know, are involved in giving us process, you know, uh, feedback, making sure that they're involved in the remediation timelines, all of that. And so that we have an agreed upon. And then Honestly, what we've really been focusing on now is using automation to reduce the noise. So security tools create a lot of noise. We don't want our engineers seeing a dashboard that has thousands of vulnerabilities. And again, like only 1% of those are impacting. So we're writing automation and we're writing the automation to actually go to GitHub and open issues kind of in their preferred method. So they only see them when they need to see them. You know, if it's critical or high, um, medium ones, we can organize into other sprints, right? Later on, you know, based on constant communication between the two teams. So there's a lot strong partnerships we've talked about with engineering, Um, depending on the size of orgs. Sometimes you have BSOs as well, where we have BSOs for particular business units uh, within our org, and they have the relationships with our engineering leadership in those uh, particular BUs. And um, we can leverage their relationships in order to escalate certain type of of vulnerabilities. So if there is a zero day that drops, um, it's easier for us from us. We can create the appropriate dashboard and metrics and where all of these particular vulnerabilities may be. We work really closely with BSOs and their relationship with those uh, engineering leaders and we can get things patched up fairly quickly as well. So the technology side, I love what uh, both Damien and Rachel said, like those partnerships, making sure that we reduce the noise. And then the human side, we want to make sure that we have those appropriate relationships with leaders that when we do tell them that it's time to run, they're actually running fast. It's not a, it's a fire drill, right? (laughs) So Jivan, you both just hit on something that made me, you know, kind of think of where my next question is coming from is metrics, right? So it's all great to have these partnerships and processes in place, but we're only as good as, you know, the next zero day. So there's got to be some metrics around this to figure out how well your team is doing in this process. So can you give me some insight as to what which metrics are the ones that you both track most closely and why do they matter? Yeah, uh, metrics uh, are sort of like the centerpiece of our program. Um, So there are some internal metrics that we want to track to ensure that uh, we're moving quickly. Um, One of our workflows is that security triages of vulnerabilities and not all vulnerabilities uh, we will triage. It'll be those uh, human vulnerabilities discovered with bug bounties and pen tests that we are triaging. And I want to make sure that um, we are triaging those quickly because we don't want them in the security queue. We want to hand it over to our risk corner queue, the engineering queue in itself. Um, But like metrics is only a part of that story. I know that we want to drive the right behavior uh, when we want to ship a secure code. So we want to make sure that we're finding the right owners and holding them accountable. And so we can provide as many metrics as possible if the owners are not going to actually fix the things the the metrics don't really matter. So which is why like, I really like to have clear metrics broken down by BU and severity and work really closely with BSOs or other engineering leaders and just make sure that we're getting commitment to fix things within SLA uh, at the very top of your severities. Like those criticals and high have to be fixed uh, right now or within the SLAs that we have. And we, and we don't have to put as much effort into the lows and informationals we should because things can be chained and um, there are ways to escalate those vulnerabilities as well. But we really want to be focusing on the most important things within the business. Um, and I also want to make sure that the business is actually understanding the amount of security technical debt that they're accruing as well. Um, so we do have an internal metric for that. Uh, so it's like the mean age of a medium vulnerability. And it gives you a sort of sense of how much security debt uh, a particular BU has. And again, it's not to, it's to help us 
discover which BUs care more about security than others, and then work with the BUs that have a very high mean age of uh, medium so that we can work with them and say, hey, what, what's causing the delays? Why aren't we able to really fix these vulnerabilities uh, themselves and partnering with them and unblocking them where possible? But if we have to, we can escalate and hold them accountable as well. Like, uh, again, those metrics are not useful unless we actually hold them accountable with them. Yes, I completely agree. Um, also, making sure that we're only counting the time to resolution from when there's a fix available. Uh, your engineers will not thank you if it's identified and no fix and we're counting that amount of time. Um, also, looking at your risk score. So how And that's the customized risk score to your environment, not based on... CVSS, CWE, or any of those scores for your environment. How, like, what are the average by business unit is really helpful by product, especially when you're presenting those numbers to leadership. Uh, another one that I use is asset inventory over like coverage. So how much are we actually scanning? How much are, you know, what coverage do we actually have over those apps? Are there any gaps and making sure you're highlighting those? You know, not everyone has different coding language and things like that. And scanning only covers so much. None of them cover them all. Um, so we want to make sure we're highlighting any gaps we have and what we're doing in those areas to kind of mitigate where we might have scanning gaps. Yeah. One thing I want to add on the... Um on the metrics is like, put some alerting on top of it. Because if you don't put some alerting, it's just a dashboard sitting somewhere. If no one look at it, no action will be taken. So I encourage people to, every time you put metrics, put alerting. So if you go beyond the threshold, it triggers action. And at least you are sure like something is going to happen. It just don't drop the ball. Uh, one other thing also to um, interesting enough to note is like, if you look at the most popular framework around like, all the engineering metrics, there are not many metrics on security. If you're Dora framework, etc., there is nothing. Security at the end of the day is not very like a high priority for engineering organization. I do believe this needs to change. Uh, it, sadly, security only becomes a priority when you add like, a couple of bad issues and it's too late. Uh, so we should really like motivate all the team to be more sensitive to security and be a great partner to security team because you want to react uh, anticipate as much as possible and, and not have to react when it's straight. So Rachel, you tapped in on something and, and Jivan did too and, and Damien, where you kind of both all mentioned, you know, customizing your risk profile. And that's something I'm curious about because like you said earlier, you know, no organization is the same. There's no environment that's the same. So how can people practice like take actual steps to customize their risk profile and what does that look like are there certain things they need to have in place before they can even do that analysis how does that occur yes um so well the way i've done this in the past is i actually get the engineers in the room and we do it by product right because every product is different so we take a couple of recent vulnerabilities that we've had we've had to troubleshoot and we look at it and we talk about certain questions what's the exploitability right has this been seen in the wild that some more security comes in and provides some details on that? You know, what is the impact of this, right? Is this exploitable from someone on the web or would they have to have compromised internal credentials? And we have a series of questions based on product that help us get to the risk rating. And so we've kind of created our own scoring, um, you know, based on those different trajectories and, and questions. And that kind of leads us to critical high, medium or low. Um, and, and that's kind of what we've done for our products. Again, it's very customizable. You need to do it on a product by product basis too, right? You know, you may be hosted in AWS, GCP, Azure. You've got to look at where that vulnerability actually lives and then how it can get kind of exploited and kind of the downstream impacts as well. We do something extremely similar. I'm glad that uh, uh, great minds think like Um uh, there is uh, a very not no well-known uh, scoring system called Common Weakness Scoring System, CWSS. We use it heavily internally. So if there are particular classes of vulnerabilities, we leverage our CWSS calculator to sort of figure out what the impact is. And a lot of the things that uh, Rachel mentioned are ca capabilities under CWSS. And like CVSS is great. It tells you the strength of a vulnerability whereas CWSS talks about the weakness in the system itself. So it's a slight difference. Um, and CVSS makes a lot of sense for uh, security tools, whereas CWSS makes a lot of sense for security teams. So uh, we'll have chats with uh, clients. So we'll reach out and say, hey, we noticed that um, 
you have this particular vulnerability in your system and we think it's really, really scary. So we will chat with them, understand the vulnerability, we'll map it through our CWSS calculator, and then we'll realize along the way that, yeah, it looks scary, but we have these three controls that are already in our system that make it very, very difficult for uh, that vulnerability to be exploited. Um, and also, we want to know what actual impact will it have to the business? Like, is this going to be company ending or is it just going to be like a small little thing that we can deal with? Um, it's really, really important to understand that when vulnerabilities come in and you sort of have to understand how you want to prioritize it uh, against the rest of the vulnerabilities that you actually have. So yeah, totally on the same page with Rachel there. I don't have much more to add, except that as you can see, there's a very strong relationship between engineering and SecOps and one cannot do his job without the other. So there's a lot of communication, a lot of like context sharing. And this ability to put things in perspective is extremely important at the company level. So we've talked about what the process looks like from vulnerability, you know, from being notified to delivering it to engineering. We've talked about what it's like from Damien's perspective in engineering. But and we've talked about some steps that, you know, in process wise that people can take, you know, to strengthen this process at their organization. What would you recommend or, you know, what feedback do you have for teams that were they might engineering and security might not be getting along right now um, and they're working to repair that relationship and really help facilitate trust to build out a practice. So are there certain steps that these individuals could be taking to kind of meet their counterpart in the middle to help regain that trust? Or do you think it's just all hope is lost? I hope not, but got to ask. It's relationship building. You have to rebuild a relationship with your peer. It's very important. Um, and also, that's why I was mentioning earlier, um, shipping resources from one team to another so they can be in their shoes and understand uh, what it means to do um, their job and what they have to go through, like priority management, competing priorities. And this is very important. And especially like for me, that's what I like uh, with my uh, security peers, like understand what it takes to fix something, a vulnerability, not just to identify it. There's like a world difference between both and help me partner with me in like fixing uh, everything we found and not just throw the ball over the fence and like, hey, it's your turn, Damien, and, and deal with that. So it's like, no, no, you, you have to help me. We have to partner with that in order to address all of these issues. So a lot of communication, a lot of like explaining each other context and why it's important and, and we are in it together. Yeah, I, I love that, uh, Damien. And it, we are in it together. We were absolutely partners. And uh, there are times where there's going to be friction and friction is okay. Um, but like, if you have that honest communication and you have that continued honest communication, you should have one-on-ones with your engineering leadership and make sure that they understand why we think it is important. And we should understand why engineering is underwater. Um, like, and like we've been through some hard economic time, a lot of companies where we had rifts or we had a lot of attrition and does it make sense to have the same SLAs and hold engineering accountable when they're maybe half the size as they were before? Like, you, you really have to sit down with engineering, talk to them, understand uh, what's happening on their end. And we have to explain to them on our end why we think some of these things are important. And then you could come to a place where you have um, like a mutually agreed upon roadmap on how to move forward. So it, it is definitely about uh, building those relationships and um, maintaining those relationships as well. Um, and ultimately, you don't want to throw your partner under a bus. If the CEO is asking about some specific type of vulnerabilities, you want to make sure that you're in alignment and not throw folks under the bus in itself. So it, it is that continued strong relationship that you build and maintain over time. Yes. And you know, giving them a seat at the table when you're developing your policies and procedures, make sure that they're stakeholders, that they're reviewing, they're revising, they're revising comments. If I go and purchase a security tool that engineers have to use or is going to impact engineering teams, they are part of the POC. We do not do things in a vacuum. Actually, I'll go with an engineering tool that better suits the engineers. First one that gives me more of the audit documentation I need because I want the engineers to actually use the tool. If they hate the tool, they're not going to use it, right? They're going to find ways to circumvent it. Um, so it's really making sure that you look at the audience, who, what those controls are impacting, and you're customizing your controls. I think a, a big piece is like, you know, oh, the audit framework is the framework. It's not anymore. Look at PCI DSS, right? That was a very regulated 
um, framework with very prescriptive controls. 4.0 introduced control customization because they realized that this doesn't work. It didn't work in the cloud environment, right? Like, you know, I was talking about firewall servers and people in the cloud are not dealing with firewall servers, right? There's different constructs today. So making sure you customize. And one of the, the things that I do too is push back, push back on auditors and controls. If it doesn't meet your environment and you're still mitigating that risk, bring the auditors to your side because they're just going off of frameworks. They're going off of what's been industry standard. And I think we've got to get away with there is an industry standard anymore. There's not. Yvonne, I see you shaking your head quite vigorously on that that last one of pushback on the auditors. Please, yeah, spill the tea. I've, I've, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, pushback, but also work with your internal audit uh, team. But like everything that uh, Rachel said is just like spot on. It's so nice hearing that and other folks uh, thinking about the same way. Like you want to do what's best for the company. And sometimes you have to do some of these uh, audit controls for the sake of doing audit controls and it's not providing any value to the business. Um, and you have to make the auditors realize that, no, this is not providing the value that we think that it should be providing. And the, these three things here that we're doing provides much, much more value as well. So completely agree with uh, Rachel and yeah, I, I love it. Yeah, don't do things for the sake of doing things like what problem are you trying to solve and only do it if it actually solves a problem. Don't check, don't just check a box. Perfect. Well, one other thing I heard too was the product roadmap and being having a tight partnership between the two. So I just wanted to ask, is there have to be some level of flexibility in that product roadmap? Because things are constantly changing, right? So I know we might have a plan for out a year, but like another project might be competing. Does there need to be some flexibility in that product roadmap for the different priorities where, you know, security might have something more pressing or engineering might need to get a feature functionality out, but that often can get put on hold due to like a security reason. So does there need to be that type of understanding between the two groups? You have to, you don't have a choice because, um, so there's like um, security project that we like deploying a new tool, et cetera, that we can schedule and plan ahead, but like fixes, et cetera, all of this is like unplanned work. So when you do your, um, your roadmap discussion and uh, like capacity planning, et cetera, we need to leave a buffer, some spare time for the team to be able to manage unplanned work. Um, also, it would be like overwork. You you pass hundred percent capacity. We need to like anticipate where that's why like all of the metrics we have, we can anticipate, have an idea of like more or less uh, how much work we have we are going to have. Leave this like 20, 30 percent buffer uh, for all of this unidentified work that we know will come. We don't know yet what it will be, when it will be, but we need to have time with that. So otherwise, like you are set up for failure, you are not set up for success. Yeah, I mean, embedding security early on into your product development lifecycle is really crucial. It helps you build the requirements and also giving engineers the ability to self-service requirements. So documenting what are the bare minimum security requirements? And I want to separate because there's security requirements and there's compliance requirements, right? And so you can have security requirements, which is what the minimum you need to launch in order for your product to be secure, right? Compliance has a lot of documentation, that goes with it. And you can separate those two. You want to focus on security because you want your product to be secure and you want it to make sure you go launch without any hitches. You don't want to have a data breach or any significant security items that pop up that customers, you know, then be become aware of. And then focus on those, drive those. And then compliance, you can pick when products are included in in reports. If you're doing an EAP, for example, EAP is usually not included in your SOC 2 report. So you can push your compliance and have time to get those audit compliance checks done through that. I think part of what happens is sometimes people think, oh, well, I have to do the whole kitchen sink, right? I have to get everything in there all at once. And you really need to prioritize it and make sure, just like you do vulnerabilities, that the critical and highs are all met. Uh, I love the talk about priority. And like uh, at smaller companies, you are able to be in a lot of discussions at larger companies where you have several thousand developers, you're not going to be in every single discussion. So there are there are the concept of pay path. Uh, you want to make sure that the engineers are using pay paths whenever possible. These are the common workflows that you have in the organization that security has already looked at and approved and uh, had helped harden in itself. And you want you want to probably less prioritize that. Uh, you obviously still want to look at the features and functionality that's going through the pay path, 
But things that are off the pay path, you want to dive into much deeper. Why is it off the pay path? Why are we doing this instead of um, doing things that 80% of the business is doing? So a lot of uh, that relationship is also to do with prioritization and making sure that we have eyes on things that potentially can go wrong and providing that feedback for engineering there, uh, especially in much, much, much larger organizations. So we're winding down our time now. And before we get to wrapping, I do have one last question. And this, you know, is the chicken or the egg, right? So I'm just going to go for it. There's a lot of different philosophies, right? When it comes to who owns the security risk. So who should own them? Who wants to take this one first? I, I can kick things off. Um, I'm, I'm a hard believer of uh, democratizing security uh, just in general. So uh, I've done work where we've democratized the threat modeling process and developers are actually doing the threat models and we review and make sure that they're doing things. But I also believe that not all security decisions should be made centrally in a security team. Um, we, we should be empowering our engineers and our engineering leadership to be able to make those decisions for themselves. So um, I, I feel that I strongly feel that security should be folks that are the ones that bubble up the risk, uh, uh, show the risk to the business, but also quantify that risk and let the business know how good or bad that particular issue is. And I really feel that our partners, engineering, HR, legal, all the partners in the organization are the ones that actually own the risk themselves. So those and those risk owners, um, we have to work closely with them and let them know that yeah, this is a bad one. You should actually work on it. And they should have that relationship with us to trust us to know that they should do with it. Um, and they should also know how much security technical debt that they're accruing and how often that they should be paying back that uh, uh, debt down. So yeah, you, you definitely want to make sure that uh, the security team isn't fully responsible for security itself. Um, most companies don't want to 5X or 10X the size of the security team so that we can actually be responsible for it. So we, we want to make sure that we make our partners responsible for security. Yes, I agree 100%. Um, I actually have a motto that security is everyone's responsibility. So security risk really cannot be siloed into one department or you know just one security team. There is a human component to everything that we do, and that introduces risk. So it's why kind of training programs, either if it's like cybersecurity training or you know secure code training, all of that is so important to put um, different techniques and different methods for identifying security risks, you know, knowing good best practices, knowing what to do in certain situations is so important um, because you can't, you can't assign it to the security team. They don't have the authority across the company all the time, right, to enact all of these changes. And then you're going to lose, you're going to lose valuable time to remediate if you make security solely responsible. You have to put some of the responsibility and some of the accountability into the individual hands that are responsible for actually implementing and doing the day-to-day -day of some of these security controls. So it sounds like you might have some playbooks for different situations there, huh? We definitely have some playbooks. <laughs> awesome. Davey, what do you think? It's It has to be a shared responsibility. Like Otherwise, you won't be set up for success. And not just security and engineering. It has to be like all departments, like yeah, HR, HR sales, there are. Uh, because security is like in every team um, and also at all the level. It has to like the top of the company needs to be aware of it, make it part of the plan to the bottom. Like everyone needs to be empowered uh, with the tools and empowered with the process and have time to address all the issues. That's the only way to be successful to like everyone has to have this ownership too. Thank you for those answers. So we are heading up on time, but I want to wrap this up and I want to hear what your advice would be for someone who's newly tackling this problem. Um, or if you prefer, you can also answer for someone at scale who's still trying to w w work through this, right? Not every process is perfect and you're constantly doing sprints to better improve. So what would be you know, your top piece of advice that you'd be giving to someone who today was sitting and watching this talk? Yeah, um, focus on the human side. Um, there are a ton of people trying to do great work within the business, build those relationships up, understand their needs and wants, and make sure you really focus on explaining security to the leaders themselves. So um, build up those human relationships uh, and a lot of great things will happen just from that. Yes, and... 
you know, whether you're starting a new process or whether you're revamping an old one, kind of coming to the table and hearing everyone's voice and point of view, no matter if you have an established process, it doesn't mean that process is going well and giving voice to your stakeholders, to your engineering teams will help you understand where you need to focus and where you need to revamp, where you may need to articulate and really give voice to the different teams involved. I think if you have those discussions and you need to have them on a regular basis, it can't just be done in a vacuum. You need to continuously check in. You know, vulnerability management is an ongoing process. It doesn't mean what you did three months ago is working now. Yeah. For me, like obviously I'm biased, but I would say be picky about the tooling you use. Uh, there's a lot of tooling out there that everyone uses and they're not, doesn't mean they are good. So um, challenge, test, make your own opinion about it. And the second advice I would give is like, what problem are you trying to solve? Don't do things for just like checking a box, really challenge the purpose of what you are doing and avoid waste time. Now I lied. There's one more question. Are there any resources that you know out there that people should be looking into to kind of get a better handle on this? Any publicly available resources? This oh. podcast? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> there we go. Hey, we can uh, we can cut this out. It'll be exactly. Edited, so. uh, under lab, we just did like a, like the AppSec Academy, which is an amazing um, starter. So I would suggest yeah. people to go through it and and do it. It's pretty quick, but you learn a lot about the the fundamentals, the basics. Yeah, I, I always rely on my community as well. So um, if you uh, I started everything off with OWASP um, and built a strong network uh, through there. Highly recommend f- folks find local chapters and get involved and understand some of the OPSEC problems from that space. Yes, I agree with all those. I think looking to at uh, different like frameworks, like I like to go look at things you know being done by NIST. I like going look at what's being published on blogs from different communities. You know. Um, looking at different companies and seeing what they're doing. I think reaching out to your network is really important, um, you know, for compliance related, you know, items and like pushing back on auditors. I actually reach out to a network of of different compliance managers and say, hey, what are you doing here? Like, how are you combating this issue? You know, this roadblock. I think opening that community for security is really important. Um, We haven't necessarily had as much communication on what we're doing internally on on security teams and being able to share that and just troubleshoot will really, you know, I think widen the visibility of common issues that we're all facing. Well, I don't think I could have wrapped this any better myself. Jivan, Rachel, and Damien, thank you so much for taking the time today to join us at Lean AppSec. It wouldn't be possible without folks like you.